is more is taste, and the Lord is touch. So it's fascinating. You know, five yeah, you something. That's the that's safer. Yeah, that's a different <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that, that's not Shemos. Rech Nechoah. That's next. That's when we get to Vayikra. Yeah, yeah. Okay. they're cooking downstairs. They're making. Uh, Okay. Next, when we talk about the names, Shemos is about Coin. names. Coin. So the Torah begins with a repetition: Yaakov came, Ishu Bezel. We go through the twelve Shvatim. Yosef was there. Okay, so the, the initial names are the ones we're used to. But then, if you give some thought. The Sefer, the Parsha Shemos, the majority of names in this week's Parsha are all women names. Leads the Gemara to say, because of the righteous women in that generation, that's what the Gemara says. The Gemara says that it was. It's a Gemara in Sota Dafir Aleph of the base that it was in the schus of the righteous women, no. right? Now, how did he do that? Like secret, secret. Book it? Let's continue. I don't know why they bothered him to bring this thing down. I would have to hash it. Okay. It was getting too warm, right? Yeah. It's a hundred bucks every time somebody breaks it, and you buy it. Yes, for this, there is money. For this, <laughs> if a hundred will save you a thousand, then you're going to have to invest into it. <laughs> okay. Let's go over the women in this week's parsha. So the first one we're introduced to is Yochel. Not really by name, because it says, by Yikach Ish, we basically know that last lady. But we know that's Yochel. We know she had children. We're introduced to some degree to Moshe, Aaron, and to Miriam. So the first two women that we really get introduced to is to Yocheved and Miriam. Some people say that Yocheved and Miriam are the same as Shifra Kippur. and Pepua. That's Rashi. What? Oh. Okay, that's Rashi. But I looked up in the Otsir Pelo Satora, and Rashi says Shifra and Pua are Yocheved and Miriam. But the Moshe of Zekeni, the Bale Hatosos, he says Sheb Shifra and Pua Nachrios were Egyptian women. Shaniz Gairu eventually they converted and became Jewish. And he says it's just impossible to believe that Paro would have trusted Jewish midwives to do his bidding. That means Paro is not a fool. He would never have had a thought that Yocheved and Miriam would kill the babies. So they were Egyptian midwives, and the Abarbanel says the same thing. They were Egyptian midwives who were loyal to Paro, who were loyal to Egypt. In the end, they didn't do it because their fear of God, whatever that means, was greater, and eventually they were Megayar. It's interesting, he says, that of these two names, Shifra and Pua, the name Shifra, many girls have that name. Right? Shifra, Shifi. If you know if you a lot of Shifa, especially among the Ashkenazi. Yeah, Shifi is a common name. Pua is not. So they say Shifra means beautiful. That means the, the, the Shufra of Yaakov Avinu, you know, like on the Kisei Kavod, they say. Right. Uh, so Shifra means beautiful, that they used to beautify the baby after it was born and clean up the baby. Pua means to cry. It says that Pua. <laughs> Her job was she would cry and dive into Hashem to keep the children alive. So I guess when it comes to names, the Yotra plus the Torah seems to imply a name that says beautiful, that's a name we name our girls. We would name our girls Shifi. Shifra means beautiful. Uh, a name Pua, which means to cry out, is not a name we would cry. Not, not a name we would give. You know, names are funny. People get very funny. For example, I knew there was this girl that was always sick, and they were very. The family was very close to Moshe Feinstein, 
And he eventually told her to change her name, but it didn't help. She died. She got cancer. She passed away. Her name was Machla. Oh. This yeah. is not the, the kids of uh, 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 Naomi? No, of Mach Salaf. Machlon, Chilion, and Machlon. Okay. okay, but think about it. The kids of Naomi, Machlon, is <coughs> Machila. He was from Machala. And once again, his wife was Rus. Kilion means Klia. Klia means to be destroyed. Yeah. His wife was Orba. He oh. never had children. Okay. Machlo is one of the Bnos Salafcha. Chagla, Noah, Malcha, Ma Ma Machlo, Tirza. is one of the Bnos Salafcha. You know, Salafcha had five daughters. Okay? So if you look in the in the Chomish, when you go through the, the daughters of Salafcha, one of the daughters of Tzalafchor was Machlo. That was her name. And it just sounds like a horrible, horrible name. Sure. Kolev. No. Well, Kolev, okay. Kolev, you know. Machlo, Tirza, Chavlo, Milka, Vinoa, Vinoa, Tzalafchor. So Tirza, I know girls named Tirza. Yes. I know Milka, Malka, and Milka, we have that. Noah, Noam, I, also, I, know, I, know, I, know, I know two at least. Chogla is not a common Chogla, name. No. Okay? And Chogla often means someone who's lame, can't walk. Really? Yeah. He's a Chogla. And Machla comes from the. It seems it to, to apply. apply. It could be Machila. Your, your sins are Machila or Machala. It's one of the two. Machila. This is. Uh, it's not. So it, it, it's, 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 it, she was always sick. From the day she was married, she was always sick. And in the end, she passed away. So I know they had gone to Ramosha, and Ramosha was of the opinion that her, the name was a horrible, horrible name. Possibly, but it was too late already to, uh, too late to, do to change it. Too late to change it. So here, we talk about the names of the heroines in the story. So we have, you know, in this week's Pasha, we talk about heroes. So we have Yocheved, got it. Miriam, Aaron, Moshe, no problem. Give me two other names of heroine, women whose names are mentioned in this week's Parsha of Shemos. Let's see how well you... Paro's daughter. Paro's daughter. It doesn't give her name. We know what her name was. Her name was, in, in Divrayamim, it uses the name Bitya. Now, most of us call it Batya. Bat? The daughter of Hashem, you hey. Do we name girls Batya? Yes, definitely. Yes, Batya. Yeah, definitely. Batya. Was was grandmother. What? Oh, grandmother Batya. Okay, it was Batya. So Batya is a, is a Jewish name. And she gave Moshe his name. Moshe had many names, but she gave Moshe his name. So we have Batya. Good. One more person, a female, whose name is mentioned in this week's Pasha Shemos. Who is looked upon as a heroine, as a, a hero? Uh, you know, Miriam. we said Miriam already. Shifrapur, Miriam, Batya. You have it. You have it. One more. Who else is there? Who else is there? That's it's, when you, when you put on the spot, it's hard to mm -hmm. think of. It. And, I, and I appreciate that, and that doesn't mean I'm not putting you on the spot. But Tzipor, right? Ah, Tzipor. Moshe's wife, right? Who was one of the daughters of Yisrael? who they say, when Yisro threw Moshe initially in jail for some period of time, she fed him, she kept him alive, she risked her life, she went down with him to Egypt, Aaron sent her back. She went with Moshe to Egypt. She was willing to go with her child to Egypt. Aaron says, we're trying to get the Jews out of Egypt, then they're not going to bring more people down, and he sent her back. But uh, she is considered a heroine. Do we name girls Tzipora? Yes. yes. All the time. Okay? So here we have Sefer Shemos. We go through the names, but primarily in Sefer Shemos, the women are the names that are mentioned. There's a one more name, I think, no? Elisheva? Elisheva comes next week. That's next week. She's married uh, to Aaron Akkad. Right. That's correct. And next week we'll have Amram and Yocheva's names mentioned specifically, and we'll talk about why that is. Very interesting why. But uh, this is a fascinating shot I heard. Uh, that I found t today that I'll tell you next week. But, you know, the, it, again, it, it drives Chazal to say, Now let's go a little bit further. Okay? 
here it is, Amram and Yochavit, there are a lot of history. Uh, Paro enslaves the Jewish people. The enslavery began with the birth of Miriam. Miriam's name was Maryam. Bitter days are here. And Paro is enslaving the Jews. And eventually he puts out a decree. All firstborns have to be killed. You know what's happening. Amram and Yochavit separate. Miriam says you're worse than Paro. They get back together. They have a son named Moshe. And they see that he's a good child because the whole house is full of, of light. So now we know very little about Moshe. We know that Bas Paro goes and dunks into the Nile. Some people say she had leprosy. Some people say she was converting. At any rate, she knows, she finds Moshe. She knows Moshe is a Jewish child. Right? She knows it. But it's okay. Because the plan was, and Yechevi knew this plan, she was not putting her child in the Nile. No mother puts her child in the Hudson River or the East River. You know, ACS will take the kids away and you're going to go to jail. Um, but she knew that the minute Moshe hit the water, the astrologers, who were very, very well known and quite intelligent, would tell Paro the Moshiach Israel has met his fate, the Gezerah will be bottled, and Miriam could bring Moshe back home. That was the plan. But Paro found Moshe, so Moshe was taken to the palace, not initially, for two years he remained with his mom and dad, because they raised him. And then, for the next 10 or 11 years, Moshe grew up in Paro's palace, he was trained like an Egyptian, but Paro knew he was Jewish, there was no secret that he was Jewish. You know, the movies make it imply that nobody knew that the baby was a gift of God. You know, Bitya, she didn't have that illusion. This was a Jewish child that she found abandoned. The sorcerer said, the Gezerah, the, the savior of Israel, met his faith, and therefore he was raised in Paro's home, and he was a very capable child. Why is this significant? Because we have to have some idea who trained Moshe. That means Moshe is 13 years old. He goes out, and he wants to check on his brethren. So he knew he was Jewish, and he knew the Jews were Jewish. Why did he go out? Moshe went out, it says, Moshe Moshe became a godol, an adult. Some people say when you care about somebody else, you're considered a godol. Other people say he turned 13. Some people say he was 20, you know, whatever the age was. He saw their, their slavery, their plight. And he had one question. Moshe had only one question. His question was, why? That was his mission. I want to go out there and I want to find out why the Jewish people are slaves. That's all I want to know. We have Medrashim as to why. It says that as long as the Jews were in Goshen, nobody bothered them. The attitude was out of sight, out of mind. It was when the Jews became so large that they moved out of Goshen and they began to infiltrate Egyptian society, Egyptian life, that Paro and the Egyptians says, we don't want these Jews in our neighborhood. And it became a Jewish problem. Okay? So that's what the, the Midrashim seems to say. Anyway, Moshe encounters an Egyptian beating a Jew. We know the whole story. And Vayar ki ain't she sees that there's nobody around. There are plenty of people around. But nobody from this Egyptian was going to amount to anything. So Moshe killed him. How did Moshe kill him? Famous Rashi. Shem HaMeforash. That means Hashem's name of 42 letters. It says that if you look at the Pasuk, where Dosan and Aviram say to Moshe, Misomcha li'ish sa'a v'shofet, who put you in charge? Are you going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian? With the words, if you count up the letters in that Pasuk, there's 42. So the Meforshim bring down a remnant. You see, there are 42 letters. Moshe used Hashem's name of 42. Question comes up. How did he know Hashem's name of 42 letters? That means it's not just the, the letters, the right order and sequence of the letters with the right enunciation. The answer, the only answer that is possible is that Amram, his father, taught him. Remember the torch being passed. The torch was passed. Age of two? No. He was home until the age of 13. That means he oh. went to the palace, but he kept coming back home. His mother father kept a relationship. 
Really? Yeah, that's what it seems to imply. That Amram trained Moshe for his mission. We always talk about the torch. The torch went to the tribes or to Yosef. Eventually, the torch was passed to Amram. Amram Levi was the last surviving child. Of the 12 children of Yaakov, who lived the longest? Levi. Mm -hmm. So he got the final torch at the end. Who did he pass it to? His son, Amro. Amro and Yocheb. They had Moshe, Aaron, Miriam. So who prepared Moshe for whatever Moshe's mission was going to be? His father. His father taught him the Torah of Esmeter, Shem, Ve'ever. And his father gave him all the information that he needed. His father prepared him. His father taught him the name of 42 letters. So Moshe knew that. He never used it. He used it this time. He killed the Egyptian using the Shem HaMaforash. Now, someone asked me in Shul the other day, on Shabbos, was Hashem happy that Moshe used the Shem HaMaforash to kill someone? I mean, is that the purpose of the Shem HaMaforash? Is Hashem's name... now? It's an interesting question. Maybe the one that he used is for that. Maybe. It's an interesting question, and I'll tell you the answer in a moment. Um, because in the Gomorrah, if you go through Gomorrahs at least 10 or 15 times, the Gomorrah has a discussion where a particular student was either disrespectful to the rabbi, to his rebbe, or showed disrespect, or spoke in front of his rebbe, before his rebbe, and his rebbe was perturbed. And the Gemara uses a term, Nosabo Enoch. The Rebbe gave him a look. And what happened to the guy? He became God somewhere. He became a pile of bones, which means the guy dropped dead. Right? The guy dropped dead. Hi. We left a trail of breadcrumbs that you should be able to follow it all the way up. And we took care of, the, of everything we had to take care of. So the Gemara talks about how different people who, if they insulted the Rebbe, the Rebbe gave him a look, and he, and he turned him into a pile of bones, which means the guy dropped it. Did he use the shame on Mephorosh? I don't know. But whatever he did, and however he used it, however he used it, he did it in that way. The guy dropped dead. So now, Moshe Rabbeinu used the shame on Mephorosh. Was Hashem thrilled with Moshe's use of the shame on Mephorosh? No, he's innocent. The, was, was Hashem thrilled with the use of the Shem HaMaforsh? That's the question that people often ask. So, I gave someone the answer. I once told you this before. Um, I said that I was once walking, about two years ago, I was walking to Shul one morning, to, you know, at Shabbos morning, uh, Hashkam, it was 6.30 in the morning, and there was a fellow outside on his balcony with a talus over his head, with his hands up to Shemaim, davening Shema, or something like that. And then he called out to me, and he asked me, was I impressed with his newfound style of davening? He says he's out on the balcony, he, sees, he feels close to the heavens, there's no roof over his head. Go on, go on the hill, go to the roof. Go where? Go on the hill, go to the forest, go <laughs> nearby. <laughs> Go to the Empire State Building. No, right that above your house, the, the forest over there. Almost, that, that was not during COVID. This was uh, before uh, COVID. Before COVID. Ah. So, uh, so my response to him was, and he wasn't happy with my response, of course. My response to him was, is, you know, how many Jews live in Kew Gardens? 500, 1,000, 5,000. I said, say it's 5,000. How many Jews are on their balconies saying Shema with the towels over there? Nobody! I said, you know, the Gemara talks about when something, someone tries something new. So you hinted about Bellevue. Right, <laughs> something like that. The Gemara says, Puk chazei bashut ma'ayim Go look in the street. See what people do. That means there's a standard. I mean, did the Chofetz Chaim do this? I don't think so. Did Rabbi Kibiega do this? No. Did Rabbi Moshe Feinstein daven on his balcony in that way? No. Did Rabbi David Feinstein? Did Rabbi Hennech Leibowitz? The Gedalian didn't do it. The Hamonam doesn't do it. When you do something that breaks rank from everybody around you, it seems to imply that it's not something socially acceptable. I don't think he was thrilled with my answer, because the next week he was out there again anyway, so it made no difference. I mean, he just didn't ask me for my opinion, and that was fine. Um, and he's no longer in this world, so 
that, that, that's the end of that the conversation. Uh, but the, the point is, someone asked me in Shabbos, Moshe used the shame on Mephorosh, and this Egyptian you know, dropped dead. Was Hashem happy with that or not? So I said to him, and I don't think people not always like the answer they give, I said to him, let's look at what happened afterwards. That means Moshe did something, the Egyptian is dead. Now, power wants to kill Moshe. Yes, power took a sword, Moshe's neck, the measure says, turned into marble. Wow. It failed. But where was Moshe for the next 80 years? Exiled. Exiled. That means Hashem didn't let this, this incident slide, and Hashem didn't keep Moshe at home, and Hashem didn't keep the secret a secret. Literally, for whatever the reason is, Moshe paid a tremendous price for what happened. So if I look at what happened, and I look at what happened afterwards, I have to say to myself, there seemed to be a disconnect between Moshe and Hashem. And that tells you something. Next, I said, did Moshe ever do it again? No. No. Dawson and Avira were thorns in his side. He never did it again. He could have. He didn't. Korach. He could have, but he didn't. I mean, he, he didn't did. use the shame on the forehead. No, no. He dove into Hashem or whatever it was. He could have used it on Paro. He could have used it on Paro. <laughs> he could have used it. <laughs> <laughs> there, were, you know, they, there, could have, there were opportunities for him to do it again. He never, ever did. So that also tells you something. Okay, It tells you something, a little bit of what happened and what transpired over here. Moshe uses the shame of Forash, however he knew it. Let's say he knew it from Amro, and it was never to be used again. Now, it's amazing that after this event, Moshe came back, and Moshe said by Yomar, Ochein no da'adavar. Now I understand. Remember, why did he go out? He went out for one purpose. He wanted to know why the Jews were slaves. He walks back and says, Ochein no da'adavar. I'm going to put it on a poster with the Chofetz Chaim's picture. Now I know. Lashon Hora. That means, Dothan and Aviro not only told Moshe, we know what you did, but we're going to make sure the authorities know what you did. And Moshe knew he was in trouble. And Paro tried to kill him. So, Dothan and Aviro not only spoke Lashon Hora, they were guilty of Mesira. And we know one of the lowest, you know, one of the worst crimes is to be Moser, to give a person over to an unjust government. You Mesira. don't need even Sanhedrin to kill him.